The earth shook violently from another impact of a Russian 152mm shell, causing dirt to fall over Stefan as he crouched in his small hole a meter and a half below the top of the trench. He spit out sand and grime and tried to rub his eyes clean when a second impact knocked him around so hard he ended up on his side in the fetal position. That last impact couldn't have been more than a few millimeters off dead center of his position. He was annoyed more than scared. The first ten times he'd come under Russian shelling since getting to the front, he'd been terrified. He froze the first time an enemy round landed just a hundred meters from his position. After only having just arrived to the trench not five minutes prior, his sergeant had grabbed him by the neck and hurled him into the nearest hole before jumping in on top of him. Shrapnel fragments from the big 152mm shells could kill and wound well over 100 meters away from the impact. But as more shells fell into and around his trench line, he realized that the fire was unusually accurate today. Once again, Stefan felt more annoyed than afraid. Each impact directly on or next to the trench would mean more work to repair the fortifications he'd been holding for the last three months, and he and the boys had been forced to abandon a perfectly riveting game of Parcheesi on top of it. No doubt the board and pieces were nothing but kindling and trash by now. Another shell exploded close enough to hurl him up into the air and bump his head against the hard soil just inches above him. He was grateful for the German helmet he was wearing. That last one would have probably been a concussion otherwise. Stefan held his breath and counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hey, get your asses out here! There were no more impacts and Stefan felt a cold grip on his heart as he scrambled out of the hole, fishing his Cold War era AK out behind him. As he pushed dirt out of the way to get out of his small shelter and into the main trench itself, he heard the voice from before yelling some more. Machine guns! We need machine guns! The voice was yelling in broken Russian, near enough to Ukrainian to be understood, but the accent was unmistakably American. He heard the familiar firing of the M4 rifle, a distinctive noise against the chorus of Cold War Soviet rifles that both sides primarily used. Clearing dirt out of his eyes, Stefan turned a bend in the trench and threw himself into a firing position just meters away from the American, already engaging oncoming Russians with slow, steady fire. Orcs! yelled the American. Soon the rest of the men had exited their hidey holes and taken positions along the wall. One of the heavy machine guns had been shredded in the bombardment, leaving it in a mess of tangled iron and steel. On the far end, though, a Cold War relic belched out large caliber rounds at a frightful rate. It was an old air defense cannon that had somehow found its way to Stefan's position. It swiveled low enough to get level, allowing the men to use it against attacking infantry and even vehicles. A Russian soldier tried to take cover behind a downed tree, but the cannon blasted it to pieces, leaving little behind of the soldier or the tree trunk. In the distance, but growing increasingly louder, was the sound of enemy vehicles approaching. Stefan wasn't experienced enough yet to identify each type of vehicle by sound, but his platoon leader was, and he heard the order for javelins over the tactical radio. The radios were, as the javelins, American-made and donated, and allowed the unit to rapidly respond to evolving threats. The Russians, meanwhile, were lucky to have a single radio man in the squad. They operated and fought like it was still November of 1939, and they paid the price for it. The American, Stefan constantly forgot his name, so he just took to calling him Levi after the Levi Jeans brand, ducked under the cover of the trench and reappeared 30 seconds later, sliding a fresh javelin onto its launcher and propping the entire thing on the lip of the trench as he searched for targets. The javelins were available to the whole squad, but by default everyone let Levi handle the system. He was former US Army and had extensive experience with the system from his time in the Middle East. Plus, it just felt natural. Let the Americans use the fancy American tech. Stefan was afraid he'd mess something up and he was all too aware how expensive the entire thing was and how vital to the war effort each one was. The man operating the javelin was at his most vulnerable as he searched for targets, forcing him to rest the entire heavy contraption on the lip of the trench and exposing a significant amount of himself and the weapon system to incoming fire. Stefan and the soldiers around him increased the volume of their own fire at the oncoming Russians, discouraging them from taking shots at Levi. The orcs barely knew their left from right, but all of them knew two things what a javelin launcher and a high Mars system look like. Stefan heard there were special bounties paid out to anyone who could destroy or capture either system. Friendly mortars started to rain down along the entire front, not particularly accurate and in Stefan's mind making more a mess with his sight lines than anything else. At least the dust and dirt being kicked up would interfere with the Russians' ability to shoot straight as well. And then the terrifying thought that it would also provide cover for the advancing Russian vehicles struck him. 
However, the Javelin targeting assembly was completely indifferent to the haze of dirt and smoke that littered the battlefield. It identified targets via their infrared signatures, similar to how radio astronomers penetrate clouds of cosmic dust with infrared telescopes. A moment later, there was the distinctive sound of the Javelin being ejected from the launcher before its motor ignited a few meters away, safely out of the backblast range for friendly infantry. With a loud hiss, the big missile screamed up into the sky. Stefan was tempted to track it visually, but turned his attention back to the orc still advancing through the mortar fire, now closing to within a hundred meters. The friendly mortars could now put the same amount of firepower as the Russian barrage did, but managed to do some damage to the ranks of advancing orcs. Somewhere in the distance came a loud pop and then a small roar of an explosion, one Russian vehicle down, and already Levi was aiming at a fresh target, visible only to him and his infrared targeting system. A round impacted right in front of Stefan, throwing up dirt which bit into his face and stung with maddening fury. He winced, then forced the pain out of his mind as he set to the task of punishing the orc that had gotten so luckily close to blowing his head off. Somewhere down the line, another javelin launched into the air. Two more Russian vehicles somewhere past the wall of dirt and smoke ceased their forward advance. Their crews permanently retired from the Russian army. This seemed to have an effect on the rest of the attack. Stefan could hear the distinctive whine of engines kicked into high gear only to recede into the distance. Nobody had told the grunts, though, who continued to charge forward and into the teeth of Ukrainian fire. Unsupported by armored vehicles, they were dispatched in short order. All in all, the battle lasted only 10 minutes, a fact Stefan took note from inside of his subterranean hidey hole as he was once more being thrown around by Russian shells. He'd gotten used to the routine by now. Immediately after it became obvious an assault had failed, the Russians struck out with revenge fire. The time between realization an assault had failed and the revenge fire differed on whether or not anyone with a radio had survived. More often than not, they didn't, giving Stefan and company plenty of time to get back to their hidey holes. Just like the preparatory bombardment, it was never close enough to infantry action to do much but annoy the Ukrainian defenders. The only casualties the Russians might have scored would be the American who refused to take cover in a hidey hole like the rest of them. Instead, he dug a shallow depression for himself from which he watched the front to make sure the Russians didn't pull a fast one on them. It was suicidal, but from the little Stefan had gotten to know that old veteran, it might have been intentional. The Parcheesi board was ruined. Orc bastards. At least he'd been able to salvage a few of the pieces. Stefan sighed. He'd seen men die and be dismembered over the last 16 months of war, but what really bothered him now was the boredom of the trenches. The interminable, insufferable, never-ending boredom only briefly broken up by short stretches of adrenaline-fueled dives into their holes and then fending off Russian attackers after. But those were infrequent along this part of the northern front. Here, Ukraine had delivered a blistering counterattack. Wisely, those in charge had called for a halt before completely expending their men, and they'd immediately dug in. The Russians did the same on their side of no man's land. But unlike the Ukrainians, they'd spent the entire winter and most of spring sending wave after wave of suicide attacks against the defenses. Bakhmut wasn't too far south of here, so he figured the Russians hoped they could punch through less defended northern areas and hook up south to sweep the Bakhmut forces, giving them all hell from behind. Ukraine had technically lost the city, but even now, as part of the new offensive, the UAF was making significant gains on the outskirts, without falling into the same death trap the Russians had before them by trying to fight in the city itself. Without the Parcheesi board, he'd have to wait until the Romanian volunteer who delivered their supplies returned in a few days and hope he'd snagged something somewhere. Most of them had phones with him, but one never knew when you'd get a chance to return to the rear areas and have access to a charger, so they were used only in emergencies or for infrequent calls to family and friends. They were under strict orders to never make these calls from inside their trenches or near any sensitive equipment or positions. The Russians could triangulate their signals and deliver semi-precision fire. Also, unless they were well in the rear, they had to keep their calls under a minute, just a quick check-in. Stefan heard that the boys further south had their phones taken from them for operational security. He was glad his part of the front was pretty static, mostly because it'd be suicide to try to attack through a half kilometer of landmines that both sides had put between them during the winter months. The defenders relaxed now that the fighting was done. The orcs were unlikely to try to attack again. They never managed to launch two offensives back to back. They were too disorganized for that. The javelin launchers had sent their armor back to lick their wounds an hour ago, and they'd used their second to last missile to blow up an engineering vehicle that had tried to move in and recover one of the disabled tanks. After that, the Russians didn't send any more. 
Fearful of the javelin's extremely long range and equally terrifying precision, good thing they didn't know that they were down to a single missile until resupply, if the Americans had sent more. He, like most of the platoon, had mixed feelings about their American volunteer, Levi. He was older, in his early 40s, but extremely fit. It was obvious he'd led a life of service. He said he'd retired after 20 years in, spending a significant amount of that time in Iraq and Afghanistan, with some service in North Africa that he wouldn't talk about. He was the only black member of the platoon and the only black volunteer Stefan had seen, though he knew there were plenty, especially black American volunteers. He'd heard there was a black former US Navy SEAL who'd been fighting at the start of the war, but he lost track of that story. Ukraine was a complicated place. He knew some of the black civilians had been mistreated when trying to board buses and trains for refugees. The nation was trying to westernize and modernize its political system, military, and cultural attitude in the midst of a war for its very survival, hard enough to do in peacetime. But if anybody was bothered by Levi's skin color, nobody had ever made a comment on it. What annoyed some was the fact that he was American. Not that they weren't grateful for him and his country, but, well, Yevin, one of the burly heavy machine gunners that operated the big 1950s anti-air cannon, had put it best, why leave your beautiful life to come be in the shit here? Yevin had yelled at the American until he was red in the face, speaking Russian because Levi only knew broken Russian, not Ukrainian. Levi just shrugged, then apologized, then went about his business digging out the fetid, swampy mud that pooled at the bottom of the trench and threatened to suck your boots right off your feet. Truth was, Stefan was a little mad too. His hometown had been obliterated by the Russians early in the war. Why would this American leave his safe, comfortable home behind to come to this shithole? Stefan would have loved to trade places. But Levi proved himself no war tourist. There was something dark about the man, about the fanaticism with which he fought. It wasn't battle lust. Stefan had seen that too. It was almost like he was chasing his own death. He shrugged as he went back to looking for more of the Parcheesi pieces. Levi was already familiar with a lot of the equipment they were getting from NATO, and that had been invaluable on its own. He hoped the man wouldn't fulfill his own death wish anytime soon. A loud shriek growing in intensity filled the air, terminating with a very loud blast, the entire affair lasting barely more than a second. Mud, dirt, and rocks flew everywhere, and somewhere several men screamed. Acting on instinct, Stefan dove onto the muddy floor of the trench, pulling his helmet tight over his head. Other men were already there, everyone squirming and crawling past or over each other to try to get to the nearest hidey hole. More rounds, this time with terrifying precision. Stefan was picked up high enough by one of the explosions that he briefly cleared the trench. He saw deep gashes open up in the dirt walls from the high-velocity shrapnel tearing the earth. The screaming he'd heard earlier suddenly died off. Then there was another impact, and Stefan couldn't hear anything anymore. Only he didn't realize that fact. He was too busy scrambling into a hole, digging himself deep into the earth. Outside, someone was screaming about a drone. So that's what it was. Bastard orcs had put a drone in the sky and used it to target their artillery. Another impact and part of the opening to his hole collapsed, forcing Stefan to dig the dirt out. Last thing he needed was to get buried under a meter of earth. The shelling was much more frequent now, and that could only mean one thing. The orcs were preparing to attack. Stefan's suspicions were reinforced when he heard the distant sound of armored vehicles, this time from behind his position. To keep them out of range of the Russian guns, the Ukrainians had held their vehicles far back in reserve, ready to quickly respond if needed. This meant the front was often left unsupported by armor for long stretches of time, and why the Americans and European anti-tank missiles were so critical. They were practically living in their holes now, making an already miserable life even more miserable. On the third day of the shelling campaign, they got unexpected reinforcements. Two soldiers came running and ducking up the rear approach to the trenches, sticking to what little cover remained as much as they could and eyes ever upward scanning for enemy drones. When they finally got to the trench, they unloaded their overstuffed backpacks. Stefan was hoping for supplies, maybe something sweet or some other kind of treat, but what they brought was even better. Drones. The two soldiers, no, kids, Stefan told himself couldn't have been more than 20, and he'd been shocked to learn that they were actually of legal age to join the military. Two years ago, they were probably sitting at home playing video games with strangers all over the world, and now they were drone warfare experts with piloting skills to match. One of the two, Hirohai, showed off a custom drone he had nicknamed the Falcon. It was small, incredibly speedy, but far too light to carry much of a payload. That's because it didn't need to. A few hours after arriving, Stefan got to see the Falcon in action as it whizzed up into the sky in pursuit of a Russian drone. The Orc drone never saw it coming, 
and the small drone with the reinforced body and blades protected by plastic cages smashed into the larger drone at high speed, knocking it over and sending it tumbling to the ground. Hiroaj grinned from ear to ear. It was an impressive feat of piloting skill. The other kid, Yochim, looked like he was probably from the Russian Far East originally and proved a crack pilot as well. He sent his drone off loaded with two grenades that he could drop from a great height onto an unsuspecting enemy position. Officially, his job was to scout the Russian lines, but he never failed to drop his deadly cargo right on the head of an unsuspecting orc, sometimes literally. Stefan thought he'd get some kind of joy out of watching the Russian soldiers writhe about on the ground, peppered with shrapnel and slowly bleeding out, but he didn't. Not that there was any good way to die, but this seemed dreadful. He'd watch in high definition as men bled and died out just meters away from their comrades, who were too afraid of the drone coming for them to run over and help him. Once someone did, Joachim dropped a grenade on him too. From then on, nobody came to the aid of the wounded. It was a strange war, both sides shelling each other sporadically, the Russians far more frequently than the Ukrainians due to their superior stockpiles, while launching drones armed with small grenades at each other. 21st century industrialized warfare had turned into some dystopian retro-futuristic version of World War I trench warfare. Men feared the drones more than artillery, at least you had a second or two warning before the first shell hit. But the drones flew so high up and were so small they were practically invisible. Yevin was complaining about the food running low, the big bear of a man easily eating half as much more as everyone else. He wasn't wrong, their resupply hadn't shown up when he was supposed to, though they were reassured via radio it was coming. For now, they cut back to one and a half of the American MREs a day just in case. The food was surprisingly good and packed with calories. Stefan had actually gained weight at the front. He especially liked the little water-activated heating pouches that came with the meals so everyone could enjoy hot food without any kitchen support. He toured a Russian trench taken a few months ago in heavy fighting and found their food stocks nearly all expired and absolutely disgusting. The only thing that seemed like it was still edible was the tinned fish. Even the bread had turned hard as a rock in its plastic wrap. The date of manufacture on one of the boxes read 1994. There was no expiration date. Somehow that didn't surprise Stefan. Of all the aid the West gave them, he was most grateful for the javelins from the Americans and the French and the German field meal kits, in that order. On the sixth day of the Russian shelling, though, the unit was introduced to another piece of Western aid. The hammering they were receiving was getting increasingly worse day by day, meaning the Russians were definitely planning a big move. Instead of dread, Stefan felt relief, at least when the attack started, the damn shelling would finally stop. A few of the guys had been exhibiting shell shock, but there was simply nowhere to send them. They'd be society's problem when the war was over, ruined by serious PTSD, but right now, they were needed here at the front. Besides, there was just no way to get them to safety right now. Amidst the latest barrage, a strange rapid-fire series of roars grew in intensity from behind Stefan's position. From his hidey hole, he could see just enough of the sky to witness several very fast-moving shapes, leaving smoke trails behind them. Not even a minute later, the shelling abruptly stopped. Curious, Stefan and the rest of his platoon began to stick their heads out. He spotted Levi grinning ear to ear and looking toward the rear. On cue, another round of shrieks and more fast-moving dark shapes leapt into the sky, leaving behind dark smoke that quickly dispersed as the rocket engines burned cleaner higher in the atmosphere. Stefan lost track of the shapes in the sky, but about 45 seconds later he could hear the dull thumps of high explosives going off. The platoon cheered from the muddy trench, then ducked by instinct as they heard the sound of Russian guns firing off, realizing they were firing over them. The rounds impacted somewhere far to the rear, well out of sight, but from a completely different direction came a response volley of more high-speed precision rockets. The guns that had opened up in retaliation to the first Ukrainian counterattack went silent. Ukrainian artillerymen had set a trap for the Russians, using swift and agile HIMARS launchers and counter-battery radar to destroy Russian artillery hammering their trench. By the time the Russians responded with their own counter-battery, the HIMARS trucks were already gone. That's when a second HIMARS unit opened up on the second set of Russian artillery, destroying them too. Artillery was Russia's sole remaining advantage, and nobody was happier than Stefan and his crew that Ukraine was finally wiping it off the battlefield. The Russians only fired sporadically now, too afraid to conduct prolonged bombardments for fear of drawing precision counterbattery fire on their own heads. This gave the Ukrainian front some serious breathing room, and the expected Russian attack never materialized. Yuhim and Hiroi confirmed that there were less soldiers on the Russian side than before. Stefan sensed an opportunity, so did his higher-ups. When combat engineers arrived, he knew life was about to get a lot more interesting 
and dangerous. The infantry resented anyone who had the luxury of not living in an insect-infested or mud-drenched hole for most of the war, and this included all the armor guys, the artillerymen, and the drivers who ran supplies back and forth for them. They were often subjected to significant abuse, in a mostly good-natured way, whenever they found themselves sharing a trench, but nobody razzed the engineers. Because there was not a single infantryman who'd trade for their job. With Russia creating hundreds of square miles of dense minefields, often directly supported by artillery, the job of clearing safe lanes of attack fell on the combat engineers. Even with the big, tough engineering vehicles America had supplied them, the job often fell to men on foot with regular old minesweeping equipment, who'd usually complete their missions while under enemy fire. When a detachment of engineers joined them in the trench, Stefan knew soon it'd be him crossing no man's land to assault the Russian trenches, but it would be the engineers going first. Now check out what's wrong with Russia's military, or click this other video instead.